Thank you for coming to Naked Thoughts. The theme tonight is the robots are coming. And we're exploring this idea, this thing that all humans do, which is talk about the future and kind of just wonder what it's going to be like and be scared of it and talk about it and think about it nonstop. Our next guest is, uh, she's a fearless comedian, but she's so much more. Ladies and gentlemen, Tumi Meraki. Hi. Hi. Okay. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, which is probably most of you, my name is Tumi Marake. And um, my brief was to talk about a few of the future. Robots are coming. What are my robots? So I wrote a book. And um, I think for about two weeks, before it came out, when I realized this thing is printed and it exists in the world now, it was my robot. I didn't want it to come out because I realized how honest I was in that book. It's called And Then Mama Said. And there are a lot of things that my mother used to say back then which have peppered my life today and make me wonder about the future. So in speaking about a fear of the future, I think to my, my chapter, well, a couple of chapters where I spoke about a fire that raged, a fire that I began. In 2016, I was invited to the Marble Bar in Rosebank by a station manager and a, pro and a station producer. No? Yes, a manager and the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> and the conversation was around me joining a radio station that I would never say if somebody just went, so which radio station do you want to work for? Would I ever have gone, that one! <laughs> but they wanted to do something new and it excited me about the future. The angle was, if you listen to South African radio, it doesn't really reflect what's happening in South Africa. You don't really wake up to hear a white dude, Africans maybe, with this black chick, talking about their lives. This mother, this wife, who's light on life and light on her feet, chatting to this Afrikaans oak who loves music, is a musician, and talks to people every day. The idea being, you take an audience that's still living a little bit in the past on a journey with you. You grow it and everybody sings Kumbaya, the rainbow is there. <laughs> Mandela arrives with his wings and his halo and blesses us again, you know? And we hold another World Cup. Anyway, um, <laughs> so the future was exciting. The robots were exciting. These things are going to make my life better. Fast forward to about a month before we go on air. We hang out in Pretoria, of course, as one does. <laughs> if you're going to join a traditionally Afrikaans radio station, you're going to eat in Pretoria. <laughs> and we decide to put on a wall the things that are red flags for the union and the things that are going to make this union work. And the exciting thing about this union was realizing we are so similar. We are so similar. And the things that are different, we found so hilarious, we said we have to work them into the conversations on radio. The things in our personalities that were hectic, we also put out there. And I asked the question, I'm very aware of race in this country. Not because I am a pan-Africanist uh, activist. Uh, no, I was just born to parents who were active in the struggle. I was born in a homeland. My parents were arrested for treason. So because I grew up like that and from a very tender age when already you're trying to understand brown and, and light and or brown and pink, there's also a deeper thing you're trying to understand about hate between people who are different. There's nothing deeper than the fact that their skins are different and they're hateful of each other. So my awareness of race came to me at a time when I was developing as a person. So already I was racially aware when a lot of kids are still trying to figure out whether the tooth fairy is real or not. I knew race and I still believed the tooth fairy was real. I did, guys. I got my 50 cent without fail for every tooth I lost. But I also knew 
that there's this person called an Afrikaner who's very powerful, who doesn't want me in certain places, and where we are is the best place to be because there's more of us, and we all speak the same language, so it's even better that way. In fact, our lives are better than those guys that side in South Africa. And I said to them, guys, this could be a dangerous thing because I know that you have a very diverse listenership because I've also opened books and I know those books tell me that this language Afrikaans doesn't belong to one color. In fact, if you count the people who speak it, there are more of color that speak it than those not of color. But there is a group of people who will be made uncomfortable by my presence. And I want to know what happens if they ignite a conversation that takes me in the direction of race. And the response was, you are who you are, you will handle it, and we will have your back. Again, the future now wasn't as exciting, but I was like, I feel like I can take it on. In September of 2017, I found out that a group of South Africans who live in Netherlands had had Steve Hofmeer banned. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but I was a Steve Hofmeer fan for a long time. I even had his CDs, Do Not Judge Me. <laughs> Do not judge me. I grew up in the Free State and the Northwest. I have every excuse. It's the way he went, boom, boom. That just... <laughs> yes, Steve, yes. Anyway, but I also knew he had a very, very strong, proudly African stance, which initially I was all for. Because I had learned that identity is important, because I knew oppression, and because I knew how important it is if you feel that you as a race, as a people, are in any way being told you're less, if anyone is trying to erase your culture, you have every right to fight tooth and nail for your identity. So I had his back. I didn't agree with his methods, but I had his back. And these guys decide, let's talk about the fact that Steve has been banned in this place. And my first response is, no, we're going to start a fire. We cannot talk about this guy. We talked about the guy. And when we talked about the guy, the people who were angry about my presence in this space attacked me more than they already had. By this time, on a daily basis, I was being told to go back to the bush, go to a soccer stadium, I'm so loud. Can't I use that other accent instead of this accent? And the future became scary. At some point in a conversation that I backed up, I backed out of that conversation because I thought, you know what, this is a trap. It's better I sit this one out. On some level, I was going, ah, this is white on white crime. I'm not getting involved. You know what I mean? Because it was the pro Steve camp and the anti Steve camp. That's what I thought. Then it became, but why can't the blacks get over apartheid? And again, I went, the future of this country. Mm. You know, I once heard a guy say, if we're not careful, the history books are going to say Nelson Mandela was white and no one will be able to dispute it. You laugh, but it can happen. Because of the way we treat our history, it's made me scared of the future. I was a comedian who was so used to performing in mixed audiences. I'd had two one-man shows. Each of them made me feel like a mini Trevor Noah because every race was represented in my shows and well. When people were destroying statues, I was speaking to Jan Hendrik, I was speaking to Kuobas, I was speaking to people you wouldn't believe I was speaking to about what it meant that this was happening and what it did to history, ugly as it may be. That's who I was. When I got attacked, it was very hard to figure out who I'd become. I didn't know who South Africa thought I'd be when I walked out. Because when I came to this place, I was that girl who was unafraid of our past, spoke about it freely, did not hurt a soul, but rather pointed out the ridiculousness of our past and our mentality. Now here was a space that called me racist, that said I wanted white people punished, simply because I likened apartheid to a bully taking a child's bike, an adult coming to the playground and saying to that child, no, 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 just share nicely with the bully. Play nicely with him. Now think of yourselves as children for a second. Remember your mentality as a five, six-year-old, seven-year-old. Do you know how hurtful that feels to you? The injustice. That feeling that no one cares that you were hurt. 
yet you must worry about the person who hurt you. My fear for the future came when I realized I don't know where I live. That people would threaten my life, would threaten my family, would go after me every way they could, and when they realized they couldn't touch me, started going after the people around me. Martin's show started getting banned around the country. The station had advertisers threatened to pull their advertising. And what I found ironic was, I was like, somebody out there must know me because I do care about the people around me. I didn't care about what they tried to do to me because I'm fearless as fuck. My balls are of steel. I will take them on. <laughs> and I was able to take on that fight. They came at me. They came at me. They tried to even use disabled people to get at me. After a roast I'd done, where I did a gag in context, I listened to it again in context, and I realized that it actually did not hurt the disabled community. But because I care, I made it right with them. And I'm glad that even before I tried to make it right with them, they messaged me and said, we can see you're just a pawn in a bigger game. This is not about us. We understand. And now I'm scared about the future because I am married to a foreign national. I'm, I'm married to a man with very foreign blood. He is, his mother's from Lesotho, his father's from Ghana. My children speak English. The Setswana in Sesotho is embarrassing, which is my fault. <laughs> and they live in such a mixed world. Best friends are Italian, Chinese. My house is the, U it's the United Colors of Benetton, guys. <laughs> I need to prepare them for that world because I lived in that world after the pain I'd experienced even as a child. I did not know South Africa could be that ugly. They are on the internet more than me. My firstborn saw what the people on Twitter were saying after our accident, that it was karma, that we deserved it. Three small children. When we had this accident, I was talking about an eight-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old, that people who claimed to be of God, fearing family, people, God first, God is love, were telling me karma was the reason those small children deserve to die. Because the assumption was that we were dead. These messages weren't sent out when they found out that we were fine. These messages were sent out after an image of my car was sent out. And my car was a mess. I'm scared of the future because I don't want to turn my children into people who are afraid to express themselves and be who they are. This country claims to be about unity and diversity, but we're so scared of diversity, we're very quick to be a rainbow. A rainbow is nice because the colors are not merged. They're perfectly next to each other in unison, and that's where the beauty lies. And I'm scared we're not seeing that. We're not. I have never been afraid of the future like I was after my experience at Jacaranda. Because to this day, if I get a corporate gig and the room is white, the first thing I wonder is, do they believe the shit they heard because I never got to clear my name? You do not know what it's like for it to stop being normal, to arrive at a gig and just talk. I look at the makeup, I look at the age of the white person, I try and figure out if they're Africans and then decide if I must be careful. The future is scary for me because we get excited about technology, but our most basic, basic human things are still so fucked. Why? If I come to you and you're white and I talk about apartheid, I'm not saying you. I'm saying a thing that fucked us both. When I think about apartheid, all the expletives come. Like I can speak like a normal church-going child, but we hit apartheid, yeah, the fucks come. <laughs> I get so mad. I get so mad because if we're going to live in a neo-racial society that is not focused on race, we need to deal with what race is now. And I'm shit scared that it's going to take us a while to get there. I really am. If I call you out on your privilege, it's not an attack. I'm saying a system was built that has screwed you. I don't think you people even realize that. Apartheid screwed black people in a very obvious way, but it screwed white people, especially Afrikaners, in a way that is not obvious. I cannot imagine what it is like to grow up feeling so supreme and superior and go into a world that is going to remind you every day that you're not. I can't. To be dependent 
on a government that put away gold for you, gave you jobs you probably weren't ready for, but said, these ones are for you, doesn't matter, you will figure it out along the way. And then you must raise children who must try and benefit from that thing you benefited from. But then you're angry when someone reminds you of that. When you tell me, but your father fought hard, he put himself through university because he worked in the railways. My father wasn't allowed on the fucking railways, bitch. It's not the same fucking race. Your father ran with sneakers and he got a 10 kilometer head start. My father was barefoot and had to catch up with your father. We are screwed as a people. So I am a little bit scared of the future. A little bit because an old man once said, you know why the country is taking so long to fix itself. It's like a goat. If you take a rope this short and you tie it to this pole, it's going to walk within that circumference. When you untie that goat, it's going to keep walking in that circumference, even without that rope. Where I'm excited about the future and I feel like we might beat these racial robots is that I feel like there are very few people who are like that. There are more of us who are not afraid of that conversation. We are so damn curious and I think it's a brilliant thing. We are so curious about each other and I hope we don't stop. I hope we don't stop being curious about each other. I'm excited when someone who doesn't understand asks me about my hair. Teams, you had like no hair yesterday. Oh my God, how is your hair this long today? You know, I must explain to her Brazil, India, Peru. <laughs> That's my time. But um, don't give up on us, man. We pulled off a World Cup on nothing. <laughs> we haven't imploded. And the world is still excited about us. That's me. Thank you. Thank you.